Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. My name is Joe, and with me we have Shal and a new guest tonight, Richard. Tonight, as you can probably tell by the accent, we are going to be doing a full review of the movie Brave, which came out in England not too long ago. But first, uh, let's introduce Richard and let's hear his favourites. Richard, if you'd like to begin. Okay, so um, my first one for the favourite series that came out over the last five years is the the Ricky Gervais show, the animated series, because obviously he's got uh, he's got more than one series. <laughs> But uh, it was specifically the animated series that I liked because it's um, it's basically uh, Ricky Gervais, uh, Stephen, uh, oh, what was his name? Stephen. Um, oh God, what? yeah, yeah, I forgot. Yeah. I remembered it earlier. Uh, well, Stephen and Carl Pilkerton. Uh, oh, yeah, Steve Merchant. Yeah, that's the one, and. Um, the reason I like it is just uh, an insight into Carl Pilkerton, Pilkerton's mind. Um, he's he's one of these people who you're not sure if he's really stupid or just he points out the obvious. It's um, he he thinks things on their basic level and in a way that's more insightful than what most people think of. If that makes sense, like he's not overanalyzing things and therefore. He gets things. He, he sees things differently to most people, and most people would think he's stupid for it, but he's really not, really. <laughs> okay, so it's sort of the anal- analysis from the point of view of somebody who doesn't know very much, or sort of somebody who sees the basic level of things. Yeah, someone, someone most people would call undereducated, and a lot of people would pass off as an as a as an idiot. But I don't. I don't really think he is. At first, I did, but I, after watching more of the show, I realised he's he he just thinks things differently. He thinks things on a more basic and under co- less complicated level, which I think is uh, which is a, it's a good thing, you know. <laughs> okay, so uh, yes. The choice for favourite series within the last 10 years. Okay, now this one was easy. It was, even though it was a, I had to ask if I could put in an anime for this. It was um, Higurashi and Anaka Koroni, which was made in 2006. Um, it's had a number of series. Um, the ones of note, well, the ones I actually like, I would rather say, is series one, obviously. Uh, series two, and most episodes of series three. Uh, not all of them. Some of them. One of them was a, a filler fan service sort of episode. And while while I can't stand seeing something I love so much be deduced fan service, it does kind of um, throughout specific bits of the series they've always tried to put in moments where the characters aren't in such dire. Um, situations, you know, moments where they can just be themselves, which is um, this episode um, is. It's them going to a to a, um, a water park, basically. But uh, there is an awful lot of pointless fan service in it, which I felt um, the episode could have done without, and it would have been just as good. But then I would have to ask what the plot of the episode would be. Because the entire plot of that episode is they need to get one of the characters' underwear off. <laughs> <laughs> but um, other than that, series one uh, is a I can only describe as a complete joyride out of mind fuckery. Um, I can't really say too much about it without giving away major plot points, which people, which if people ever want to watch this after hearing this, they don't want to know. Because it's one of those things that you're trying to figure out what's going on because you really because things just don't seem to make sense. So if you enjoy mysteries, it's one of the, it. You should love this anime. But um, if you hate being confused, it's not for you. And uh, you'll you really enjoy uh, trying to figure out what's going on, and you won't know what's going on until probably the last couple of episodes. Um, 
in the first series. In the second series, it's all made painfully clear what's actually going on, and you just think, and it's all about how they, uh, how one of the characters solves what's going on, how how they get the perfect ending to their time, basically. Okay. And uh, series three, I probably I probably wouldn't say is one of my favourite series unless it had the episode which made the entire um, two series before it make sense in. In fact, it was only one scene, like one character's one character's speech made the entire series make sense, as in morally, that I understood what was going on. But it, like, why was why, what was the what was the moral of this of Higurashi? And it doesn't appear until episode uh, episode four of series three, which is actually my favorite. Is also my favorite episode ever <laughs> of anything. <laughs> Such a confusing, confusing gory anime. It is. <laughs> yeah, it's not not one for people who don't like gore either. Well, but, they like seeing uh, Moe like characters gore. being mutilated. It's for them. <laughs> exactly. If you love gore, then it's definitely for you. I found it hilarious, <laughs> <laughs> especially seeing the character the character I like the least get mutilated. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um. Favorite series within the past, uh, which is uh, older than a decade. So now this one, I had to think of one because over the last, over all of my life, there have been lots of lots of um, shows I've watched. You know, I've watched things like Hey Arnold, Recess, The Wild Bumberries, uh all sorts of things. But I always, like, I was trying to think, well, which one did I like the most? Which one, when it was on, I couldn't get enough of it. Um, and I, I ended up uh, putting one that I actually saw very little of um, because it was it was on occasionally, but um, it was on so long ago that I could I was too young to really be able to follow a TV guide at the time. And it was a it's a series called Reboot, which uh, it wasn't a it wasn't a cartoon. It was a uh, it was a 3D animation made in 1994. So it was quite an early. Well, I I don't know if it was an early. Anime, uh, CGI animated show, but it was it definitely felt futuristic at the time. Like it was like when it first when I first started watching, it, I was like, "Wow, this is this is the future right here." Uh, eat your heart out, Pixar. <laughs> Even though Pixar probably already had several films out by this time, I can't, I, I'll have to look that up. And Pixar's animation has always been better than reboots animation was, but at the time, it was great, and uh, even though the, I, I rewatched an episode a few uh, last year, um, I thought I'd re- I'd start the series from start, and um, I was just like, wow, this is actually really stupid. Like the plot is really paper thin, <laughs> and the dialogue was really clunky, and well, not clunky, more like a like a ch- like a really young child show, like uh, like Blue's Clues. <laughs> Where are we going to go today? Okay, okay. But on the <laughs> other hand, that, that show did have Tony Jay as the villain, who is always awesome playing villains. Mm. He played, uh, he played Megabyte? He played Megabyte, yes. He also played mm-hmm. Count uh, Judge Claude Frodo, Frollo as well, so... Mm. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, favourite animated movie? Okay, this one was, this one was easy. Um, because I, uh, I don't have, I well I do have a number of um, animated movies in my uh, my cupboard downstairs. Um, there's one that I remember watching when I was very young, before I even heard of Disney, and it was The Last Unicorn, made in 1982. Uh, do you know this film, Sean? Yep. <laughs> yeah, you know that film. I I love that film. Even when I was like two, I watched that film, and I always, I, I actually often thought it was an anime because it's got that look about it. It's got the, uh, the, the big, the big eyes about it, I suppose. But it's actually, it is actually a western made. Um, I think it might be. I, I would say it's western's attempt of an anime, I guess. At least that's what I think. Um, 
I might just be talking nah. nonsense. Nah, but, nah, it's uh, fine, it's fine. Um, but it's, all, it's got that it's got that classic animation to it, where um, the background feels like a hand. Well, it feels like someone drew it out by hand, and they're animating the characters on top of it, a bit like the original um, Berserk series, which is another anime. But um, I've always liked that when it's like uh, it's like when you watch a really old Scooby Doo. You can always tell which dumpster the dumpster's hiding in because it's the only one that looks different. Like it will be highlighted compared to all the others because all the others are drawn on background, but that one dumpster was drawn in uh, <laughs> uh, with the characters in the so it can move. Like if, if go back and watch a, a Scooby Doo, an old Scooby Doo episode where and wait for a scene where something is hiding and try and guess where it is because it's probably in the one that that is a, a different color and shape to all the others. <laughs> Classic, yeah. Okay, uh, favorite <laughs> episode. I'm sorry if I'm kind of leading you at the nose here, but we do have a oh. deadline. Yeah, um, I actually already gave my favorite episode um, a minute ago with the Higurashi. Yeah. Um, it was Higurashi season three, episode four, the one that made all the episodes previous to it have a moral. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, favorite short. Um, this one, I actually told you uh, the other week, it's Gary's Game by Pixar, the one where the, gut, the old guy is playing with himself. Okay, okay. Uh, the reason this one's my favourite is because um, it was after, it was like either after Toy Story or Bugs Life on the video, and um, I'd actually finished watching uh, the film, and then went off somewhere, and came back a few minutes later to find it still playing, and I thought, oh, this is weird, I didn't know this was after the film. And because I came back halfway through, it was um, it was very odd because I didn't realise that he was actually playing a game with himself. <laughs> because um, the an- the animation starts with him sitting down, setting up his chessboard, moving a piece, and then getting up and walking around to the other side, and then moving another piece. And um, but. I didn't see that bit, so all I saw was the bit that came a bit later on, where it's just it's uh, it's just cutting to him taking already taking his glasses off and making his next move. So I actually thought that he was playing playing this uh, game of chess with someone else down the park, and then when it finally turned when it when it got to the end and finally turned out that he was playing with himself the whole time, it actually made it was actually a lot funnier. So I I often feel like they should have just cut out the first few minutes of that. Uh, Or maybe just shown one of them down and have the other one seem like he's already there, but it actually being him anyway, if that makes sense. Okay, okay. Um, Yeah. Okay, so that's your favourite short then. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, The Million Kitten Award for the series that needs more love. Um, Again, I... I'm going to have to say reboot because um, while it did have a rather long runtime, I've not seen it on since. And um, I've never met anyone who knew about it, really. um, It's it's just completely disappeared off the face of the earth. It's on YouTube, but I've never met anyone or talked to anyone who knew about it. And I haven't seen it on TV since I was like six. So I feel like that needs that needs to come back basically because they're always making these new shows. Why don't they just use old ones? What you mean a reboot of reboot? Yeah, basically. <laughs> okay. Reboots option. <laughs> um, the Cosmic Retcon Award for series you want scared from existence. Okay, this was e- this was um, Star Wars Clone Wars because I. Like many people, despise the um, the Star Wars prequel. I can't stand them. They're they're pretty and all, and yeah, they're good for a quick uh, sword fight, but that's not what Star Wars is about. And um, in Clone Wars, they've just done away with all the pretending to be about something more than sword fighting, and just got straight to sword fighting. This is the. This is the uh, animated movie rather than the sort of original TV series, then? No, it's both, basically. Okay. 
All right. So because uh, they're, they're just as bad as each other, to be honest. And uh, I just because in all in uh, the Empire Strikes Back, Yoda's all t- talking about how um, the, not even that like the Force isn't about being strong. It's about um, it's about being wise. It's about being at peace and with the universe. And uh, not and he, his 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 line is the Force doesn't make you great. And all, and they've just completely done away with the force at all, and gone straight to let's hit each other with light sticks. That's all. That's all the the prequels is about, and that's all the Clone Wars is about, even more so. Well, Star Wars is all about putting money in George Lucas's pockets. Exactly. He he doesn't he hasn't stayed true to what he originally set out to do, and it's just degenerated into the Clone Wars. Okay, um, so yeah. you're you're saying that um, you want another series which is more like the original sort of more mystic side of it rather than what could essentially be a rather violent rave. Well, I think if you're going to make a Star Wars series, you can't make it about the Jedi because the Jedi are all about peace. So if you can't have a show where you have a bunch of old people meditating, then it's got to be about something else. So... Why not focus on a smuggler, say Han Solo, who goes around being a general badass, um, cool guy? Yeah, we... that that would be an honest show, and people, I would, I'd have no problem with that because Han Solo is an awesome character. <laughs> well, so meditating person. isn't inherently boring because Avatar is very spiritual. Hmm. So you can make spiritual action, but I don't think the people behind Star Wars care enough anymore, no. unfortunately. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. I don't, think, I don't think George Lucas has cared since uh, Return of the Jedi. Yeah. So that's the series you want to go. Now on to the um, original ideas. We've got um, the series yeah. you most like to be made adaptations, and then the original idea mm. itself. So, um, any ideas on what you want to be adap- adapted? Well, as you know, Joe, I am a huge Warhammer fan, and um, I recently, I I did recently watch the the Ultramarine movie, which was made uh, last year, I think, and I thought it was terrible. It was, it was just. It, the animation wasn't great. The dialogue was terrible, and the plot was paper thin, and it didn't reflect the gritty. Um, it was unrealistic. Un, well, I won't say unrealistic. It was untrue to the, uh, to the. The spirit of this, uh, the yeah, well, more more the more the uh, the background, like um, the law, yeah, the law of Warhammer, and um, so it it wasn't grit dark gritty at all. It didn't make me feel like the future is hopeless, and that's what Warhammer is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a bleak look on a future where basically there's nothing you can do but fight and die in a war that no and no one will remember your name. And I, I feel like war, if they make an, a Warhammer 40k or yeah Warhammer 40k um, film or series, they need to really capture that. They need to make it the sole focus of the um, of the movie, whilst staying true to the um, Warhammer lore. So any Warhammer fan, not just the little kids, can look at it and say, yeah, that is pretty much what Warhammer is about. Now Warhammer Fantasy would be different because it's obviously not such a bleak outlook. Um, so I feel like the 140K, the Ultramarine re- movie rather, it feels more like it, how a Warhammer Fantasy film should be. But, so I, I, just, I just wish they could, they could do that and get it right, you know? I feel like um, the Space Marines would be a bad choice in this matter, because like, they're not supposed to feel hopeless and bleak. Um, they're supposed to be heroic. And that's what they were doing in bit. Well, that's how they were portrayed in the Ultramarine movie, but they weren't doing it right. If that makes sense, I can't. I can't really put a finger on what how they didn't do it right at the moment. But like um, how the film went, uh, how they should have done it is had, I, in my opinion, focus more on the Imperial Guard because they are a lot more hopeless than the average Joe can can. Uh, 
can relate to them basically because they're just blokes who have been shoved into war, some against their will. Okay. Yeah, they're trying to make it kid friendly for something that's really not meant to be kid friendly. Oh, Jesus, no. <laughs> <laughs> One thing which I think could have been quite interesting is if they did a um, adaptation of the Horus Heresy series. Mm, that would be good because they've all, they've written the Horus Heresy series, and it's very clear set what happens. But and you can't. So the only way you could mess that up is if you then um, basically portray the characters wrong. And how can you when it's already it's all written out in novel format for you? It's like a, it's just converting a novel into. I guess stage direction. Mm. It isn't well. Well, I don't. I won't say it isn't hard, but it doesn't take that hard. Okay, and now um, for the final topic: uh, original ideas. Um, I couldn't actually think of anything for this. I wasn't quite sure uh, what what was being asked, and um, if it was what I was thinking, it was. I couldn't think of anything anyway. Well, what were you thinking? What were you thinking it would be? I think I was thinking you were asking if I could make make my own show. What would it be about? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, and uh, I couldn't really think of anything. There was there was that um, I have been trying to write a story over the last like two years, but it's been really slow and uh, unprogressive. I, I I haven't even started the plot. I've just been trying to get background done. So okay. I guess all I could right. say if I want anything made, it would be that. But I guess I've got to get off my ass and get on with it if I want that to happen. Okay. I know your pain. <laughs> <laughs> effort is okay. so much effort. So we rendered that up. Um... Okay, Richard. Thank you very much for your favourites. Um, now to move on to this week's main topic. Um, not recently, I think last week, some sometime, uh, the Pixar movie Brave uh, hit uh, British cinemas, and uh, we've all gone to see it, as we are want to do, and so uh, we're going to. This is pretty much going to be a retro review for anybody outside uh, outside the UK. So um, if you haven't seen the movie yet, spoiler warning: we got we are going to be going into spoilers. So, yeah. Uh, where should we begin? And who wants to go first? I suppose we should start at the beginning. All right. Good choice. Yes. I like this one. He's clever. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, basically about a girl that doesn't like the life that's been set out for her by her mother. She She doesn't want to be her mother. She wants to be who she is. And so the film is basically all the freedom to do what you want. In typical Scottish style. I remember hearing about this film ages and ages ago. Um, I was reading a thing that was an article about how Pixar is really amazing at writing race. Not so good at gender. And that until Brave, all their protagonists were male. What makes Brave in- even more interesting for me was that this project was written, directed, produced by a woman, and you very rarely see that. Mm. It was her idea. She got Pixar to listen. She directed yeah. it until until like two months from the end of production when someone else took over. I don't know why she left production, but a dude took over. But yeah, I just find that unusual, and it kind of shows through in the film. And that very rarely do you see something about mother-daughter relationships that doesn't involve a lot of shopping. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, quite frankly, it, it, if I may be sort of, in, in the terms of sort of, in the terms of, sort of the production of this, it, it does sound like it was, I mean, you can tell the sort of, it, it was a sort of letter of love, love to sort of the whole idea of, being your own person and all that, but also um, it's also quite interesting from the point of view that, as you say, Pixar have mainly approached things from having a sort of uh, from having a Y chrome, sort of having a Y chrome, and it's interesting to see uh, them try to do a female character and a female dynamic because quite a lot of the times um, it's been sort of always been boy and sort of best friend or sort of uh, friend friendships or sort of brother 
brother relationships and so on and so forth in their city. Father and son or like Mm. family dynamics from the dad's point of view. Yeah. Boy and father figure. It's very rarely you get the whole mother-daughter relationship uh, from the daughter's point point of view. Mothers usually and... die in Pixar films. Mm. Mm. They're good for just giving birth then dropping dead. They don't really have a bigger role beyond that. Yeah. So some of this film was told from the mother's perspective, specifically um, when she was talking to uh, Billy Connolly. Yeah. Um, and uh, and um, Sarah Dill was talking to her horse. They were both mirroring each other, I suppose. Mm. Which does show, you know, she already is her mother in a way. But it also it, it really shows that um, the what I got out of that is that they were trying to say you should try and listen to both sides of an argument. Mm. Because usually you'll end up finding that you both think the same way. You know? Mm. Yeah. The, the thing I came away with most from Brave was, and I admired it, for this, because so rarely does anyone actually like head near this moral, is that mother-daughter relationships are hard. Mm. You can't magically fix things with a really amazing cake or anything like that. I mean, sometimes, the, the, especially when you're a teenage daughter, you are just as stupid as teenage boys. Believe me. I and mean, I was a teenage girl, and I didn't get along with my mother then very much at all, even though she hadn't really done anything. Because like, I was a teenage girl, it was God, expectations of me tidying my room are completely unreasonable. I want to be my own person, who doesn't tidy her room. <laughs> Which Bray captured very well. Yeah, but... it's all about teenage rebellion. One of the things I also... One of the things I also noticed was because of the fact um, it kind of almost... Uh, there's quite a lot when you got uh, Disney movies, where you get Disney Disney princess movies. Quite a lot of the time, it sort of portrays being a princess as being all awesome until someone cocks, comes in and cocks it up like a witch or something. And in this case, it's more like actually being a princess isn't all that fun. You might be able to get horses and so on and so forth, but you've got all these expectations. You've got all this stuff when it comes to being sort of dainty and stuff like that. And for somebody like for a character like Merida who's very much a more of a tomboy, more about sort of buying things with bow and so forth. It's nightmarish. So... Mm. Yeah, people don't seem to get that. Royalty is... Either way you look at it, it's a job. Being the king is a job. Being the queen is a job. Most people will even look at the fact being a prince is hard work, but most people will completely brush aside the entire fact that princess still has a role to play and she still has her own job to her own role to play as and they seem to ignore that for some reason like she's just there to get married she has other priorities at the same time mm. so, so that's why yeah. uh, that's why i never really liked uh jasmine in aladdin because she was just the the she did she just came up off to me as a, a stuck, up, stuck up princess who didn't want to marry just because she she didn't want to you know why Why didn't she want to? Why was she such a, a rebellious uh, young woman? Whereas Merida, you can see why. It's because she's a tomboy. She likes, she likes, she wants, she probably wishes she was born a guy. <laughs> so she wouldn't have to put up with suitors. Well, Jasmine, it's be- you see, it's because she was young and hot. Yeah. <laughs> with... Still, that, that's... That's not really an excuse, though. <laughs> Surely that's an excuse to get married. It, it was an ex- it was progressive for nineties Disney, believe me. Mm. At least she had more of a personality than Ariel. That's true. <laughs> a girl who sold her soul for a vagina. Uh huh. Have you seen that nostalgic review too? Yep. <laughs> the- <Rapist. laughs> I mean, the plot itself was kind of okay in the fact she wanted to live on land even though the stupid fact was she was leaving everything behind but they really squeezed in the love interest at the last second to give her some sort of deadline yeah. anyway if you think something then happened to me Eric then sure let's go with that but nope need to do it <laughs> it's not like she could have just gone on to land see it's nothing like she imagined it would be it was a complete mistake and it was just 
No, too late. Made your choice. Enjoy your legs. <laughs> anyway, um, back to Brave. It's a very um, one of the things which I thought was quite interesting is the fact that for sort of such a tomboy character, you really couldn't have chosen a better setting than Scotland, if I'm honest. Mm. The Scots, when it comes to sort of the Scots and the Celts, when it comes to sort of female figures, female sort of Scottish women aren't exactly known for being um, dainty or being sort of, I don't know, being helpless in a way. It, it, they're mm. mo- much more known to picking up a broadsword and smacking somebody in the face. You're so close to being offensive right now, Joe. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, he went beyond offensive the money put on the accent. You know he's slipping into Irish. I, I know, I know. <laughs> uh, so, uh, the, so, so Corporate is saying, yes, Celtic mythology filled with powerful ladies. And not just mythology, I mean, one of the most well-known rebels ever is Boudicca, or Boudicca, who was Celtic. Not Scottish, I think she was from southern England, yeah, she, but the point still stands. She was from the, sort of the Kent, Kent area. The IC and I were sort of Kent, Essex sort of area. Oh my god, she's from Essex? Shit. <laughs> the, one of the things which I know... So much is explained. <laughs> Something about being offensive, Alice. <laughs> um, I was fine, I was born in Essex. The, uh... Everyone's a little bit racist. <laughs> the, uh... One of the things which I... Also, it's sort of... It's reflected in the sort of their... Sort of, it's particularly ancient Celtic law. I mean, if you sort of... We only have scraps of their information, but um, quite a lot of the times, um, inheritance, it could have been passed, it was always passed to the firm firstborn, regardless of gender. And um, it was always considered, uh, women were expected to fight as well. So it's one of those situations where it's very clear to see that. And also, yeah, they did. One of the things which I got from Brave is the fact that the time period was a little bit, I don't know, a little bit fucked. Mm-hmm. If, if, if I'm honest, was it the glass windows. The glass windows threw me. The, the glass win. The glass windows, followed by the tartan, and the fact they were f- still fighting Romans. Yeah, no, they were fighting so, Romans and Normans and Vikings at the same time. I, I mean, I mean, I know Scotland's been oppressed, but Jesus Christ! Of course, they weren't but, fighting the English. Hmm. I mean, particularly the tartan that wasn't invented until. I think the nineteenth until the sort of eighteenth century. Mm. Yeah, that I know it was it was invented around the Stuart time, I think. Which yeah, eighteenth century, yeah. Oh, the Stuarts were sixteen hundreds, weren't they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. My mistake. Stuarts yeah. were like King King Charles. Yes, that's seventeen hundreds. Oh, right, right. Mm. They're both. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's eighteenth century. Seventeen mm. hundreds. Well, I, um, I know King Stuart. Um, well, one of the Stuarts, um, he asked for his own coloured tartan, and they gave him the red tartan. Mm. But I don't think it was commercialised until the 1800s and 1900s, as the whole yeah. idea of traditional clan um, tartans is a complete myth. Yeah. Mm. I know this because I once did an, um, one of my English literature essays was about a book set in Scotland that was all about like societal myths, and that was one of them. Yeah. I know this because of QI. <laughs> One of the, it's actually quite interesting to see. Um, but yeah, sort of. And also, some of the clans were a little bit inconsistent. Like, you had um, uh, Clan Dumbroch, which is the sort of um, Merida's clan, which were all sort of uh, medieval clans. But then you had. Um, oh, God, what was this? The sort of. The skinny guy with the blue face. I think that was sort of Clan. MacGuffin or something? Yeah, there was um, Macintosh and MacGuffin. They were the other two. And wasn't there a third one as well? Dungwall, Dungwall or something? Dingwall. Uh, Dingwall. But I, do, I remember Dingwall for having um, the leader of that cl- the leader of that clan um, basically being an, was an old man with spiky hair. Mm. And um, I think one of the clans one of the clans basically dressed up as um, a sort of had the whole warden, warden on his face and was sort of uh, dressed in sort of pretty much his own, only in his tartan. But, yeah, yeah, I thought they were the Nakbak Fiegel for a bit. <laughs> I'm sad they weren't. Mm. Griffin Sados! <laughs> but yes, um, 
I was actually quite amazed. I was actually quite. I really enjoyed enjoyed the movie, and also one of the things I enjoyed about it was um, the fact it didn't have a proper antagonist. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you had the witch in the movie, and she was more just a sort of. She practically behaved like any fairy godmother from the other, from any other Disney movies. Then you had um, Mordu, who was pretty much just a force of nature, if I'm honest. It wasn't exactly yeah. a villain. He was just doing what he was supposed so, to do. So to speak. And then you had um, Medida's dad towards the end, particularly when it's sort of towards the end. But on the other hand, you could very much see that he was trying to protect Medida and avenge his wife for what he saw as basically being attacked. So he had very, very understandable motivations. And so it allowed the movie, because of the fact there was a lack of a, vill- of a villain, it allowed it to focus much more on the mother-daughter relationship and Merida having to deal with what she's done and how, and so on and so forth. Can I be the cynical one here? Oh, go ahead. We need a cynical one. Um, I saw this movie before any of you did, and since then, the flaws of this film have been simmering in the back of my mind. I enjoy this film. I enjoy this film. It's a good film, but it's not a great film. Mm-hmm. And the reason for that is because I think it either needed to be longer or it needed to cut back on a lot of its content. Because I looked at this film, looked back on it and thought to myself, this is not a film, this is a first draft of a film that they didn't go through properly. And this is my reasoning as to why. I'm gonna have. I'm apologizing upon myself and maybe Alice if she joins me for what I said to you and Tom in the other discussion where we basically mocked you for the fact, oh, the men had nothing to do in the film, how terrible it must be to be a guy with nothing to do in the film. I understand exactly what the critics were talking about. Up on the, all the guys have introduced, they do this whole archery thing, and all of it is done, it's wonderful, it's funny. But then for the rest of the movie, they are sitting in the hall in the phone room, playing mini war games with each other because the plot has no idea what to do with them until the final act. The Mm. father doesn't even notice his wife has not been in her room for the last two days. I interpreted that more as being like, was with the Force of the Kingdom, when... Whenever, you know, anything political was happening, it was Merida's mum being the voice of reason and the voice of intelligence. Mm. The way I interpreted that was more like, without her around, the guys just turned to being big kids. And... Yes, but I also didn't I feel any. From. I also didn't feel any connection to the sort of antagonist, which was the actual bear spirit, which was one of the four princes, because the story kind of goes into the detail about this legend, and they may or may not be the descendants of these four princes. But if the story focused around a bit more on the background, and if she was actually the ancestor of those people, and their curse would have made a whole lot more sense to me, but it felt it felt like it drew flat when they introduced the witch for the sole purpose of moving the plot along, because she comes in, she does, she does her magic trick, then she's gone. You never see her again, she's just there to give plot to the movie. So I never felt... I never felt any great weight when it was the bear actually made it appear. I mean, every scene that's in it's terrifying. It's got arrows in its back. Its eyes are hellish. But in the final act, when the mother is facing down the bear, there was no real any weight to it, if you know what I mean. All right. Fair enough. I mean, one of the things which I found, again, sort of, it didn't, I just more treated Mordu as more not so much as I say not so much a villain just but just sort of as a walking incident. We should have uh, he was there in the very very beginning and had um, Billy Connolly's leg being nommed off, but uh, he he was always sort of everybody was sort of always talking about him, but you never actually saw him until the sort of big reasonably big action scenes or in order to put Merida in danger so that her mum in bare form could come mm, rescue her. I get the feeling that the Pixar people had been watching a lot of Studio Ghibli films because in terms of the slow pacing and, you know, the, the atmosphere of it, it reminded me a lot of, well, not, you know, the slow-moving ones like Kiki's Delivery Service, but like Nausicaa or 
I suppose, Princess Mononoke. But it was just more about the self-discovery with some incidental, possibly evil, but more morally grey people in it. I thought they were just watching Brother mm. Bear one too many times. <laughs> one of the things that, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting because I don't think there was a single sort of, I mean, I don't think there was a single sort of weak female character in this movie, if we, if we can pull back to this. Yeah. I didn't I mean, like the witch. I thought she was pretty weak as a character. No. I just, I agree. I, I, yeah. It was just like, well, okay, witch and bear and okay. She was Julie Walters? What? <laughs> it, it didn't just... She, the, the appearance of the witch didn't seem to mean anything aside from a uh, MacGuffin who turned people into bears. That was, that was her stick. I mean, I suppose... But I think my original I mean, estimation that, you know, Merida by rebelling somehow brought down a curse upon her family, I actually think that would have been a bit more interesting than I found a witch and now bears. Mm. Yeah. I, I suppose one of I suppose it could have also worked if um, she actually whisk, uh, sort of actually contacted something like the actual wisps yeah. themselves. Well, really, the, the whole point of the well, wisps is they're terrible creatures. That you follow them and they walk you off cliffs. You're not meant to follow them. <laughs> you ever notice that? Where any time she follows them, disaster strikes until the last one that leads her to her mother. Any other time, it looks like they're out to get her. Yeah. Well, I'm not too sure. First Is that the scene in the movie, it leads time? her to the bloody bear. <laughs> <laughs> leads her to Mordu. Mordu. Uh, you say there was a single yes. weak female character in this film, but I did notice that arguably 100% of the male characters in this film were weak characters, as in, not as in weakly made, but, per- but portrayed as being either stupid or... Or, well, yeah, just stupid. <laughs> yeah, they were there, more there for comedy. Mm. Until the last act. Right now. I think the father was written well, but other characters, yeah. um, each and every one of the sons didn't really get a line of dialogue. When it's all about them trying to win her hand in marriage, their fathers get all the lines and the kids are literally standing there rolling their eyes going, oh dear God, he's embarrassing me again. Even the triplets, if you took them out of the film, they contribute nothing except for the fact they need to be the ones to get the key, and really you could have found another reason for her to get out herself. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I suppose I did enjoy sort of the whole idea of the triplets basically having all these secret passages in the middle of the castle. They were, they were, they were the true villains of this piece. <laughs> I truly expected them to turn around at some point and, you know, reveal their evil ways, because it's the fact they didn't talk that scared me. Also, I don't like children. Also, what was the reason for them to turn into bears? Because aren't they under the same she, curse she of... Yes, but well, aren't they under the same curse of what's broken must be mended? Why did the ki- the triplets not get any sort of journey or whatever it's just that the moment the mother turns back to normal they turn back to normal were they just part of the package deal uh, not convenient mm. Mm. and just so yeah. they could have three little bags in suppose... it. merchandise I-, I suppose the idea is the fact that um the issue is with um merida and uh yes, ha- her mother ha- and so once that issue How is solved, many of you by the halfway um, point knew exactly the bond to be mend was them and not the bloody tapestry? <laughs> Everyone knew that. That was supposed to be a plot twist. <laughs> mm. Yeah, she's not that bright, is she? <laughs> I thought that worked in Merida's favour. Mm. Instead of like facing up to the idea that, you know, maybe she should try communicating with her mother, it was instead, no, wait, gotta go fix this object. Yeah, I guess, I guess the external will mean I don't have the feelings. Yeah, I guess that is kind of good because throughout the whole thing, she doesn't blame herself for what's happening to her mother. She blames the witch or blames something else around her. And it's not until the final scene where she sobs at her mother's feet saying, it's all my fault, this is all my fault. Then suddenly the curse breaks because she admitted it, it was her fault. Mm. But that sort of makes the story rather one-sided, I felt. It's like it was she should have just shut up 
the whole time and done what her mother said. That said to me. <laughs> mm. it's, it's not so much um, she should have shut up and do, done what her mother said. I more sort of it as they finally sort of reached an understanding more sort of. Well, understanding was, if you sort was of reached looked at more this... earlier on when she was giving the speech to the... To the uh, That's a very uh, good point. <laughs> that was the understanding on the mother's yeah. side. On Merida's side, she was still holding back and being quite, well... I shouldn't have to change. Everything should work itself around me so I can do what I want. Yeah. The mother was like willingly breaking, you know, at that moment, um, Queen Eleanor was basically willing to sacrifice everything she'd built up just for her daughter's happiness. While Merida was still you know, unwilling to reciprocate. reciprocate. Mm. And you really can find logic in Eleanor's understanding anyway, because she herself admits she had other commitments until she was married to the king, but she says, we're happily married, that's life, and I don't see why he's making a big deal out of it, because we know the whole thing, married for love and all that. But during her time and her era, yeah, why should her daughter be complaining? She's perfectly happy, why wouldn't her daughter be? You she's can still going to be a fucking princess. Yeah, you can see the understanding. She has no idea why she's putting this out of proportion, even though we, as modern-day viewers, know why. Mm. Yeah. Wait, never but I, I did... Go ahead. No, 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 Richard, you, um, well, they, you first. The, the decision they came to in the end, how um, Merida is going to basically decide which one she likes by getting to know them, as opposed to just deciding who was best at archery. Um, I felt like, like, um, ha- how are they get? They, she didn't leave with any of them. Like, is she going to go and live with some of them? And, you know, like, spend a few months with the McGubby clan, and then spend, spend some time with the other clan. I mean, what is she going to do? I mean, they didn't really talk about that at all. And the, the other clans just seem to go along with this like it's okay. Like, yeah, why not break tradition just because the kids want to? That's not what people are like. Well, certainly not back then. They would have been like, shut up, you're getting married. <laughs> just like the mother was at the start. Mm. Why did, why did, I know Merida gave a, a very heartwarming uh, speech a few moments ago, but before that, they were all throwing spears at each other, threatening to kill each other if they didn't make a decision. That, that sort of thing doesn't go away easy. <laughs> Then again, the mother did shut them up by just grabbing them by the ear, so maybe they just said, yeah, we're not going to argue with the Queen's word. (laughs) Mm. (laughs) The teacher is strong in this one. (laughs) I I mean, the the way they they did act basically like a bunch of naughty naughty school children, and so having Merida sort of basically channeling her mother and basically keeping them all in line, I think that kind of Swung them around a bit. I was actually amused by the fact there was only one queen, despite the fact there being four tribes present. Yeah. Well, I assume they'd have um, assume they'd have the wives back. Really, home. if all the wives are like Elnor, you think that they would have willingly just said, <laughs> "Yeah, sure, I'll stay home while you marry your son." Or were too <laughs> clever enough to go. It may be it's like in <laughs> Viking society where the dudes did the stuff outside and the woman was ruler in the house. Hmm. Mm. I don't know how Scotland works. Maybe the mothers just wrote the letters of acceptance and took the nearest chance to send the men away. Indeed. Mm. Finally, finally, the men are are gone. We can actually get this place properly (laughs) sorted out. Rather than people running off and fighting fighting each other, we can actually get this place running like a proper economy. (laughs) Okay. But yes, um, despite our nitpicks, um, favorite part of favorite part of the movie. Let's go around and sort of fa- say our favorite parts of the movie then. Hmm. Anybody want to thinking. go first? I'm probably going to be more right. open. I'll no, probably no, go no, first. My answer's awful. <laughs> All right. I think my favorite part is um, when. Uh, it's actually towards. It's actually the start of the movie, because um, that way you get a real sense of um, of the family sort of cohesion between Merida, um, Eleanor, and um, Fergus, uh, her dad, 
King Fergus, played by Billy Connolly. And it sort of all works together and sort of all sort of sets everything up nicely and adds this sort of wonderful sort of moment of awe at the movie. And then as she's sort of off playing in the woods and then more do do comes, it actually sets up that threat of this big bear who bites the king's leg off really, 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 really well. But sort of just towards the start where it's her first birthday and her mum is playing around, playing around, playing hide and seek with her. I don't know. I just kind of find that really, really sweet. It just sort of really nicely set up the rest of the movie. No, I'm sure it wasn't her first birthday. <laughs> no, of course not. She she looked about sort of five you or six at the time. Birthday. So yeah, I agree. The opening was was stellar. Mm. So my mm. my answer to the favorite part of the film is all of it. I re- even the, even for all its flaws, I really liked it. I'm gonna buy on DVD, and mm. I'm down. If I had money, I would so be buying the Marida dolls because <laughs> I just really like this film, and I like the shift it stands for, and I like I don't really like all of the things. All of the marketing Disney's done for it because in the advertising they were just like, "Hey, it's Milan in Scotland, mm. yay!" And um, of course, for the, the, um, um, uh, uh, mark mark the, um, the um, products product. and stuff, you've got the fancy dresses and the pastel blue and the jewelry. But on the other hand, you've got weapon sets. <laughs> so I like what Brave represents. I liked Brave itself. Uh, is that really wise to give weapon oh, sets to yes. children? Yes! <laughs> Come on, me and my brother grow up plastic swords and guns. Look, it's perfectly fine. So you can't even use the okay, narrative okay, to I'll... shoot people with. I know, yeah. it's strong like two loops. Just give them just soft-headed arrows, they'll be just fine. They'll have fun. They may break a TV, but that's all part of the fun. <laughs> Who wants to go <sighs> next, then? My favourite part of the film would probably be um, right after she says on the one time during the week she gets to be who she is and she goes off riding, you see her practice her archery and she climbs the side of the cliff or waterfall or whatever and she, the pure look of joy on her face, she's having so much fun and the atmosphere around her, it really is beautiful. I also really liked the music of that bit as well. Yeah. Sort of, yeah. It was like it was one of those bits where all the way through the starts it was like nice ambient, mu- nice ambient sort of background music, and then sort of that moment it's like suddenly lyrics, l- suddenly lyrics, proper song mo- moment, a montage. It's like that was a little bit weird, but yeah. Um, um, Richard, I'd have to say my favourite part was the bit where the the three clans were rowing. Up to the castle, because uh, I just I just love the whole um, them all trying to out basically out drum each other with the uh, with the boat oars and um, shouting uh, shouting taunts at each other. I, I like that bit. I thought it was amusing. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, um, general thoughts on Grave, good and sort of people should go and see Definitely. it. Mm. And buy it on DVD and love it forever. <laughs> I still stand by my decision it's an okay film, but I do not regret watching it, and yes, I will be getting it on DVD. Woo! Hear so, that, yeah. Disney. Okay. All right. And so with that, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's time uh, we call to, an, call to an end. And so it's good night from me, and it's goodbye from the rest of us here, and we shall see you all next Bye-bye. time. Goodbye. Bye.